Well, it's a brave man who ventures into the competitive world of women's fashion magazines. So when I was given this assignment, it was with some trepidation that I pressed my nicest slacks, put on my best blazer, moisturised and sashayed off. I had to scrub up because I was meeting Laura Brown and Joe Elvin, the editors-in-chief of two of the world's glossiest and most influential magazines. And, of course, they're both Australians. Now, if you're expecting something out of the movie The Devil Wears Prada, then you're only half right, because there's a whole lot more to the business of beauty mags than just Champers and Chanel. They're feared and admired. And they have the power to make or break. It's a really competitive world that I'm in. You have to be competitive, be tough. Yeah, people could also describe that as being difficult to deal with. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure I have my moments. With their designer handbags and perfectly assembled outfits, they ooze swagger. An iconic yet rare breed. You were channeling Miranda Priestly. I could... Oh, yeah, right. Come no, on. Gonna, where's the coat? I'm going to throw it on you. They are the editors-in-chief. Morning. When you say that you haven't stabbed anyone in the back, extraordinary. Well, they're all dead. They wouldn't talk. Um, no, I haven't. I haven't. I have been really boringly decent. <laughs> Jo Elvin oh, so she could just come straight after and Laura Brown Carolina needs to wear a colour. run two of the world's biggest fashion magazines from London and New York City. This is supposed to be the hottest ticket in town. It is the hottest ticket in town. It's supposed to be, how dare you. It is. <laughs> they have countless celebrities in their little black books. She's pretty epic. Little mental, but epic. And dictate what's hot. I love a kitten heel, and I'm going to go and buy those Zara ones. And what's not. Oh, this is for you. Oh, yeah. Extremely groovy. Yeah, that's me. That's like. But they have two main things in common the monumental challenge to save their magazines from terminal decline, and the place they once called home. Well, you're the first Aussie to run a fashion magazine in New York. Uh, a bit major fashion title, yeah, yeah, that, I know. What does that mean to you? I'm proud of it. Yeah, I, I'm very proud of it. The real gift that being Australian gave me was, you know, there was a lot of rejection letters and there was a lot of, you know, really pushing to get that foot in the door. But just, I didn't give up. Where once the editor-in-chief's role was simply to produce a monthly magazine... Hello and welcome to episode 20 of Glamour's Hey It's OK podcast today. Today, in a world where financial pressure digital demands and fickle millennial audiences dominate, there's much at stake. If you get this wrong. I'm, uh, it's over for me. It's over. It's become a tough industry to navigate and survive. These two were freaking brilliant. Yeah. That video in the elevator. Running the title is all about finding new strategies to keep the brand relevant and readers locked on. So the social media part of it now is, is crucial for the health of oh, the magazine. Absolutely crucial. This here, fashion closet, except it's bigger than a closet. It's like bigger than anybody's apartment. An only child raised by a single mum, Laura Brown always loved fashion and magazines. It is a bit of a um, female fantasy, this room. It, it really is. I feel like you should play like, is there some sort of choir music you can play like? Oh. How did all this start? Delusions of grandeur from a young age. I mean, look at that. You get to, like, play with gorgeous Valentino dresses all day. Like, I come in here and I feel like I'm an eight-year-old. I'm like, woo! I would see a Vogue magazine or a Harper's Bazaar magazine and still, like, be like, oh, you know, look at that. And I ended up, like, spending all my money on magazines, which I think, regrettably, are still sitting in my poor mother's apartment. <laughs> but when I first came to New York, I remember just looking up at everything and just going, is this real? And After working in Sydney and London, in 2001, Laura moved to New York with a suitcase and $5,000 to her name. Oh, it's a long way from Western Sydney. Yeah, it is. It is a long way from Western Sydney. Before long, she was fashion and executive editor at Harper's Bazaar, making a name for herself with some infamous creative covers. I'm keen to represent women well and be kind and funny. And... In August last year, she was poached to run the hugely popular 
US InStyle magazine. If someone had told me at 18 or 25 that I would be here and in the job that I'm in and this would be kind of my local, you would have then laughed. my head might have rolled off and <laughs> rolled down the hallway. <laughs> <laughs> You've done it in style. Ah, oh, done it somehow. <laughs> Here in New York City, it wasn't that long ago, there were paper boys on every corner. Nowadays, even the newsstands have all been standardised and shrunk. There's no question, newspapers are in decline. But when it comes to magazines, well, the numbers are still very impressive. There's about 7,000 different titles on sale here in the US alone, feeding into an industry worth about $24 billion. Into that mix, Laura Brown's title, has 30 million readers every month. That's big business and big pressure to make sure it stays in demand. In this game, editors in chief, like Vogue icon Anna Wintour, steer clear of letting their guards down. If you were a model, what would you do on the catwalk? I'm not a model. If you. <laughs> but Laura does the opposite very publicly. Hi, in style, I'm Rosie Huntington-Whiteley. And I'm Laura Brownington-Brown. <laughs> Her 120,000 Instagram followers are treated to daily updates, both personal and professional, as she finds ways of exploring the digital side of publishing, while poking a little fun at herself. Arms go like this. With jazz hands? Just no Why? jazz hands, straight hands. She's a trailblazer in every sense of the word. And she's revolutionising the industry, the meaning back. more readers, more clicks. Mm. Tracy Anderson. You want to do some Tracy Anderson? This is hopeless. I don't mind taking the piss out of myself at all. A hundred odd thousand followers. You're almost a celebrity in your own right. Ah. Uh, nah. But some of the great editors of all time have been public figures too, haven't they? Take Anna Wintour. Yeah. I mean, she's been a public figure for... A a long time. There's, you know, no one can touch what she's done or what she is. I know it's uncool to say you want to be like her, but you know. I want to be. I, I, can, I know it sounds really cheesy, mm. but I think um, the success that I've had has come from being myself. She's fabulous. You, you. Sh it, it should be. Sixty minutes is not enough. You need <laughs> like hundred and twenty minutes at least. Laura's boss, Alan Murray, reckons her ability to create a demand for online content is exactly why she got the top job. Why would you hire an Australian to run a huge Dear fashion God, magazine? I don't know. Oh, because she has a, a, a great sense of magazines and of the visual, but also because she was such a powerful presence on social media. When you're the editor-in-chief, the buck stops with you completely. We need to start working out which celebs... And Across the Atlantic, sharpshooter Joe Elvin is the original Aussie powerhouse. You just have people walking around with very glamorous feed bags. She's the editor of UK Glamour magazine, which she started in 2001. An astonishing feat for a young journo working in London. You've been Britain's editor of the year five times. You've gone from being a Westie originally <laughs> to calling yeah. the shots in fashion in London. That's, yeah. a, that's a big journey. I know. Who would have thought? If you'd seen, if you can find the pictures of me with my 1988 perm. The Charlene editing, perm. A, 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 it was the Charlene perm. You would never have guessed that I would be, you know, heading a fashion magazine in Britain, but all those pictures You've have come a long way. in a mystery. Yeah. Under Joe's watch, Glamour became the number one selling women's magazine in the UK. And Jo herself quickly became one of the most influential editors in Britain. How many years do these covers represent? We're coming up for our 17th year. This is 16 years of covers on this wall. When you look at this, do you think, gee, I feel tired? <laughs> Definitely, yeah. It's a lot of work, isn't it? Oh, yeah. I feel old. I mean, one cover can age you 20 years dealing with celebrity agents. <laughs> but like most magazines, in recent years, Glamour's circulation numbers have dropped. And with the rise of digital, the nature of Joe's job has changed dramatically. When we first launched this magazine, we did have a website, but it was that thing where it's like, you'd do the print product, and then you'd say, oh, what should we do online, you know? So when you started, it was all about the magazine? Pretty much, yeah, mostly. But now you've got to do a lot extra. Well, basically, no story idea cuts the mustard unless 
we know how we are going to be able to use that on all different platforms. So everything has to find a way to live in every part of that glamour universe. So that's a huge change to my job. It takes a pro like Joe to devise a plan that'll keep glamour circulation high. And she has. She has written, these podcasts make my tube journeys. There's now a weekly celebrity podcast to record. Like she's the focus. Pop-up events to organise. Even the physical size of the magazine has grown, all in an attempt to drag readers back. Oh, the pressures are on, aren't they? I mean, well, when were they not on? You know, I mean, it's, yeah. it's, I don't know. It's always, it's always been competitive. It's always been hard. It's always been so that you know, you don't know one month to the next how it's going to sell. You roll the dice. You do everything you can to make it a great product, and you hope. But that, that's no different than pre-internet. Do you think magazines are following? newspapers into the never never no i am a big believer in print remaining and i think that if you you can get caught up if you get too precious about print um and you're not moving with the times you won't last you won't last at all i'm gonna stick my heart on it and say i really think that there's going to be an even bigger falling back in love with print over the next year or so. For, all, for how great online is, it makes a lot of people feel terrible in a lot of ways as well. And I think that people are starting to realise a renewed appreciation for what cutting out all that noise can do when you just have something glossy in your hand. We don't have a plan. Just pack our bags and run as fast as we can. Both Laura and Joe face monumental challenges. But if anyone can tackle them head on, it's these two Aussie chicks from the Sydney back blocks. Is this your dream job, Jo? Yeah, it totally is my dream job. It's fantastic. Yeah, that's looking good, thanks. You know, after 16, nearly 17 years, sometimes I'm sort of embarrassed to not be bored. But the job changes around you all the time. There's definitely relentless stimulation and challenges. I'm talking about the 24 billion dollars. Yeah. You got it's 30 million people reading it every month. Is that an ulcer or an aphrodisiac? Ah, uh, aphrodisiac. Good question. And it's not in a aphrodisiac in a power way. It's like, look who we can engage, look who we can la make laugh, look who is just somewhere having a conversation with, and look who is somewhere that I wouldn't expect that read something in the magazine or read something online and they had a laugh or they bought a pair of shoes. I think that's great. Insta is, you know, one of the biggest brands in the world. And it's like, I said, like I stepped on an ocean liner, I'm trying, I'm sort of turning it into a speedboat. That's what my mission is, making it more kind of groovy. Really, so you, know? you sort of want to put the QE2 in the Sydney to Hobart? Kind of do. Good analogy. Hey, oh look at you. I want to put the QE2 in the Sydney to Hobart. I do.